just going to start right away. So I was uh, not born with Tourette's. I got diagnosed when I was around eight years old. I, um, it started around when my parents had separated from each other. And, um, and I just somehow started to develop these dicks the next day. Um, they were first just involuntary. Uh, they were just like cracking my neck or kind of did a uh, twitch with my nose. Didn't really, you know, affect too much. So I thought it was just something stress related. And, um, but then they slowly, slowly got worse as time went on. So we got it checked out by my uh, pediatric doctor. And he just said it might just be stress related. It just calm your nerves. They should go away soon, but they never did. So I ended up going to a therapist at the age of around nine years old. I, I went to a therapist and then that's when I got diagnosed with Tourette's syndrome. I have mild Tourette's, which means I don't have, I used to have vocal tics, but now I don't anymore, but I'll get to that sooner or later. And um, so it was tough knowing that I was diagnosed with something that's not very common. Not many people, you know, had it, especially I didn't really know anyone that had it. So it was tough, but um, I kind of got through it then. So I was in elementary school still at the time. So I, you know, I, not many people noticed it really because it really wasn't that bad. Um, it got to the point where I started having vocal tics and that's what kind of scared me a little bit. Um, I wasn't, you know, I just couldn't control it. I was lost. <laughs> so I ended up going to uh, middle school then and middle school was the toughest time of my life. Middle school, uh, let's say it was indifferent for me. I, I didn't fit in very well. Not many people, you know, wanted to be my friend or, um, you know, they just, sorry my bad uh they avoided me pretty much at all cost and i really had no idea why i thought i was just a regular person you know but um again middle school was the toughest time of my life and i just couldn't do anything i used to do uh very loud vocal takes kind of like a guinea pig with sound but i would blur it out out of nowhere and i have i had no control over it so even teachers, the staff made fun of me. They would get up in class and imitate me and mock me. So it was just, it was not, it was not cool, but I had to deal with it somehow. And starting of seventh grade, I found myself kind of an outlet. I would, I was still going to therapy, uh, talking with my a therapist and, um, or psychiatrist, I should have said. And he gave me outlets, uh, fidget spinners, um, you know, uh, make a fist with your uh, hands or just all the different things that helped me out and um, or to relieve the stress because it felt like a knot kind of pushing into my chest and again I couldn't control it it would just come out so beginning of eighth grade I developed an outlet to where if I got insulted in any way I would turn that insult into a joke like I would do it purposely the, any kind of tick that they were making fun of, I would do it purposely and just laugh it off. And that, that really helped me boost my confidence during those hard times. Even with teachers, I would change the uh, insult into a joke. But um, it, it, was, it was definitely tough. Like I said, I didn't have a lot of friends. I, not many people you know, wanted to hang out with me, even outside of school. They thought I was different. I got told I was different or that I don't fit in. And it was hard, but I, I was able to dealt, uh, deal with it. And that's what I think really helped me out. And especially because my mom, she was a big inspiration for me. And uh, she helped me out a lot. And then um, beginning of high school. High school was definitely much better. Uh, the people definitely helped me out a little bit. And I was able to fit into further groups. Um, many people said that they don't even notice it anymore because they know me so well now. And it was, it, like I said, it was, it was hard. I was still made fun of freshman year of high school. High school was, it was definitely better than middle school was. Um, all of a sudden 
sophomore year, uh, my vocal tics, they started to fade. And I have no idea why. <laughs> it just it just happened. I woke up and I'm like, wow, I'm not making noises anymore. <laughs> and um, what else? I my friends noticed it too, so that was that was pretty cool. Um, I just kept working on myself though, and then I got instructed to start meditating to make my physical tics kind of go away. So I started meditating. Um, meditation takes it takes a lot of discipline though because I'm not always able to do it at that time. It's hard to not focus on anything else happening whilst you know outside or especially these days you're always focused on all this stuff happening around us. Um, so now I'm a junior in high school. I, um, I'm doing school at home right now. So it's helping me a lot. Um, sadly, obviously I can't see my friends and whatnot, but, um, beginning of December of 20, uh, December of 2018, we got a dog. We named him Callum. He's a Rhodesian Ridgeback mix breed, and he has been the most help I've ever gotten. The day I got him, we, you know, we brought him home and he'd come up to me and he seemed to like notice something about me. And um, he didn't really know, you know, how to, he just looked at me funny. <laughs> that's, that's how I describe it. And he was just, um, he know he feels when I do the ticks. I've noticed this because uh, a few weeks back I had like kind of a tick attack where I did the ticks constantly, maybe for like an hour or two. He was next to me. He came up to me and tried to distract me. And then he would want to play. He nudged me, or he'll do all these things to get my mind off the ticks, and then the ticks would disappear. So all my ticks are mostly gone. They still come up here and there. Uh, my therapist did say, back when I was little, he did say that the Tourette's could go away, but it very rarely it does go away. But if I live with it, I'm going to be okay. You know, um, it is hard. It was very hard for me to get through, you know, elementary school, middle school. It was hard. I got called out a lot. I, um, I forgot to say this, but in middle school, I got suspended like twice for disruption of class. And it was hard that they just didn't understand what I felt. But um, it's, very, it's so different to be, uh, it's so awesome to be different. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't be anyone else if I wouldn't have Tourette's. I don't know who I would be if I didn't have the Tourette's syndrome. And I think the Tourette's is something that makes me really unique. It's something that helps me get through every day. And I accept that I have Tourette's and I'm perfectly okay with having it. I love the Tourette's, but um, it, do, it does tend to a struggle here and there. But um, it, 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 it makes me unique. And that's the big thing that the Tourette's should not bring someone down. It should make you unique, makes you different. I think it's boring to be normal. <laughs> I think it's amazing to be unique and different. So that's why I have a speech called Different is Okay. And that's kind of how I, that was kind of my speech right there. Different is, it is okay to be different. So there you go. Hopefully you enjoyed that speech. Thank you so much, Shane. And I think, you know, a common theme that we've seen throughout the day from our very spe uh, speakers and presenters is that different is okay. Um, so thank you for sharing a little bit about your journey. I'm going to kind of take a moment. Uh, now, everyone, we're going to transition to the panelists so that uh, they can answer your questions. I'll just wait so that panelists can put their camera on. And if you want to take a moment to either think about your question, if you want to either submit it in the chat, or if you'll do like last time, raise your hand and then we'll call for you guys. Um, so I'll just give one moment until I see the panelists um, with their cameras on.
Okay, so now we will have um, Ben Brown, Dr. Katrina Lindsay, and Haley join Shane to answer some of your questions. So let me just look at the chat. Um, or if anyone has their hands raised, if there's any questions. One question that was said earlier today to me is, um, did you tell your friends if you had Tourette's syndrome? And if so, how did you tell them? Was that to me? I'll ask to you, Shane, and then Ben and Haley, if you'd like to interject after. Oh, okay. Uh, can you repeat the question one more time? Yeah, absolutely. Did you tell your friends if you had Tourette's syndrome? And if you did, how did you tell them? I did tell them that I had Tourette's syndrome. What I said is just straight up, I had Tourette's syndrome and that it doesn't affect me in any way. I mean, yeah, it does, but um, I just told them straight up, I have Tourette's syndrome. So if I make a noise or if I do a weird twitch, I told them just to ignore it. If you talk about it, that's another thing I forgot to mention. If you talk about it, it makes it worse. So my friends don't even notice it now because I think that's because they're so used to it. But yes, I do. I did tell them that I have Tourette's syndrome. Thank you, Shane. Ben and Haley, I don't know if you'd like to interject. Uh, I can. In my case, oh. no. Um, no, so the answer for me as a teenager is no, I didn't talk about it because I was too ashamed and wish I had um, for the, the reasons I talked about earlier. I'll yield the rest to, uh, to Haley, but, but with me, I was, I was way too, I kind of bullied myself into not opening up. So, yeah. Um, so I didn't even know I had Tourette's syndrome until I was about 17 and 18. And I did decide to tell uh, some friends and about half of them were like, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I see it. But a lot of them, I asked recently about uh, my peers that I went to high school with and I asked them, did y'all notice them? And most of them said no. And I'm, I'm, I'm amazed <laughs> because I've, <laughs> I worked on suppressing them so hard because I didn't know that that's what it was. So I was told that I needed to stop it. Um, but now... <laughs> As an adult, I talk about it so much more and people don't even really notice it anymore. They're just used to it. Thank you for sharing, Haley. Ruth, I see that you have your hand raised. Um, so I was wondering um, if anyone had any um, resources for uh, people who are like struggling with mental health in general, um, but maybe don't have the um, money or time for like regular therapy i'm gonna actually dr lindsay if you're on i might ask if you answer this question yeah great question ruth uh yeah i think therapy unfortunately is so expensive right and mm -hmm. some uh medical insurance is covered and some don't which is totally cruel and totally unfair so i think ruth in your journey probably the most important thing is to know that you're not alone. So a lot of my patients um, that have not yet to commit to therapy, what they do is they go on the uh, first Tourette.org, um, but also have joined some Facebook groups and some Reddit groups that are specific to the needs that they have. So um, for there's actually a Tourette group on Reddit. They help each other with competing responses or additional stressors. There's um, OCD and anxiety and ADHD comorbidity uh, Reddit uh, strands that are really special and important to my patients um, and then also the Facebook Tourette group so I'm actually part of that and I love watching people with TS help and support each other so that's probably where I would start um, if this is something also that you're interested in I know my institution we have a teen group and that's free of charge because um, we're doing research um, and so even though you're a Jersey girl, um, we have had uh, teens out of state participate in our teen group before. So if that's something that's of interest to you, Ruth, just uh, reach out to Natalie and she can help you connect with me. Thank you, Dr. Lindsay. And Ruth, we also have um, uh, support groups here at the Tourette Association. Uh, we also have the Youth Ambassador Program. So there are also other avenues. Um, and if you have any other questions, you can definitely reach out to us and we'd be more than happy to help you. I see that Chris, yeah, no, go ahead, Dr. Lindsay. Oh, I just thought of something too. Ruth, I don't know how close you are to Rutgers. I know you and I were talking about Rutgers earlier, but Rutgers has a lot of really awesome teen support groups 
that are facilitated by their graduate students. So their graduate students need clinical hours for their clinical psychology degree. So they will run those groups for free. So that would be another resource for you. Yeah, I um, I actually work uh, with the leader of the um, their Tourette's program, Dr. Graham Harkey. I don't know if you know him. Um, yeah. But, so yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, so it's right in your backyard. That's awesome. Great. Thank you. I see that Christian has their hand raised. Uh, I actually have a question for Ben. Um, I noticed that you have a tattoo on your arm, and I was wondering how the tattoo artist um, reacted when you were ticking. That, that's a really good question, because that's something we've been talking about on the podcast a little bit of, you know, if you have muscle tensing tics, especially like the kind I do, uh, how do you get through it? And with me, I think the sensation, and this is just me speaking for myself, but the sensation of getting a tattoo is kind of painful. It's, it's a burning kind of feeling. And I think that was overwhelming enough to where I was able to kind of steady myself and keep my mind kind of distracted on that. But there were definitely times where I had to, um, I felt the tick coming on and I basically warned the tattoo artist that uh, hey, I have to readjust. Yeah, I, we didn't talk about Tourette or anything like that. I just said like, hey, I'm I'm gonna reposition real quick, and I would just kind of get it out in that process, and then he would resume, and then the feeling of the tattoo needle would be so, you know, again, kind of painful that it was almost like, it, it scratched the itch, so to speak. Thank what you. are some coping mechanisms you guys use during like tick attacks and things like that? Um, I use my dog. Um, she, well, we, we got her before I started. Well, I've had a tick disorder like almost my whole life, but before like I got my full um, blown like Tourette's and everything. Um, so I've had her for a long time now, and she um, really calms me down during tick attacks. She she like, sorry, um, but she like knows whenever I have a tick attack, she'll come right to me, and then she'll like climb up on top of me and lay on me and like kind of like soothe me. And those that's the like sort of thing that always like stops my tick attacks. I have some eye ticks where I can't focus on anything and they're darting across the room and I found it useful to use a laser pointer on the wall and move it slowly back and forth until <laughs> I can like catch it with my eyes and then it slows it down. I try and focus on something besides my ticks. So if I am ticking um, at home, if I'm, if I'm having a really bad tick episode at home, I'll try to distract myself and focus on something else. So I'll grab my trombone play some scales or something or play some video games or just go on my phone like that distracting myself helps me um cope yeah i do the same thing i do something to distract myself i mean if it's a really bad tick attack and i really can't do anything i try to like listen to music or turn the tv on to try to take my attention away but if something were like I can actually do something other than sit there and tick. I try to do some art or something to try to distract myself. Or again, I do something with my dogs. Um, but yeah, no, the distraction thing is pretty much. Now, yeah. like I heard on, um, my dad sent me a TikTok. Um, it's Tourette's cop, and one thing that he does is um he sings for his ticks. That helps him. So like um, he'll sing to help him tick. So like if if he lets his takes out like during the song so he can get like baseline or something. That used to help me when I was growing up, uh, singing and dancing and just performing. I did a lot of theater and show choir growing up. And 
that was the best outlet for me to get my ticks out. Now I think my ticks have gotten a little bit uh, more severe as I've gotten older. Um, the best thing for me though, I love to go outside and spending time outside, especially on my front porch, I have a swing and that stimulation is just really good for me. And guys, yeah, science I'm, back to, oh, go ahead. No, 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 I, I was gonna say, I, I have to echo what Haley said. Uh, I, I just find going on walks to be the most therapeutic thing for me and sometimes you know, if it's something that I can't break out of, I think giving myself a competing physiological response, like going out in the cold, even though cold kind of, you know, it makes me tense up and sometimes it brings about different ticks. Just having a jarring kind of experience sometimes kind of breaks me out. And for those of you that said uh, music and dance and singing and instruments, so science backed you up. So the same part of your brain that you're using for a competing response, that focus and working memory, that's the frontal lobe. And that's the same exact part of the brain that you're using when you're playing an instrument or singing or dancing. So you're actually doing neurologically kind of the same thing that you would do in CBIT. Thank you, Dr. Lindsay. Um, I'm going to the chat for a question. I see that Tiana and Connie, they had they would like to mute themselves and ask a question about prescriptions across states. So I might ask you, Dr. Lindsay, to take this question as well. So this is pretty new for Tiana over Christmas break. And she was going to high school in Michigan. We live in Connecticut. And um, we have been unable to uh, find a doctor that's willing to prescribe if they can't monitor in the same state. And I think there's gotta be students, like yes, she's in high school, but there's gotta be college students that need medications. And I don't understand why this is such an obstacle, especially during COVID times when, when there's video options. Um, can you help me understand that or give me some ideas of how do we manage this and let her go back to school? Yeah, perfect. So usually during the times of COVID, what's called the parity model, we're being a little bit more liberal and lax to let patients and families go across states for medication management and physician appointments. I know for the state of Ohio, so you know, we're your neighbor, um, a lot of times what we will do, at least in my hospital, is we want to see that patient in person for the very first intake appointment, but then from there we will manage medication. And so it might take a road trip, or if you guys are back in Connecticut visiting family, to start a patient and physician relationship that then can carry through telehealth for follow-up appointments. Um, and if you guys have additional questions, but I can help you with that because it gets a little bit gray and crazy with insurance and across state lines. I very much understand that. Michigan and Ohio have a really nice parity model. So potentially you guys could come and see my team over in Akron, which is at least a little bit closer than Connecticut. She's in Connecticut right now. Michigan. She's in Connecticut now, but yeah. you guys, she, the school, school is in Michigan. Michigan. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it should not be that tricky. So I don't, I don't know what's going. On. What can you tell me? What insurance company you have? Oh, it's not insurance. It's the doctors. The it's the, the doctors. children's hospital is the one that said no, and the psychiatrist and the neurologist came from the children's hospital, and the pediatrician said, "I don't usually do this. I'm not comfortable." Okay. So we're sort of um, in limbo right now. Uh, waiting for another appointment. Um, okay. But, yeah. yeah. This is sometimes pretty new for us. I'm still trying to figure it out. Yes. And sometimes it's all about that intake, that first appointment. So again, it might take traveling across state lines, doing that face-to-face -face appointment in the state, and then being able to do medical management across states. So I'll yeah, talk that, to you that's, more. What, that's what they said no to, but. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's something's tricky there. So Connie, if you can email us, we'll take your information and then we can connect you with Dr. Lindsay, if that's yep. okay. Natalie, you actually already have an email from me because you offered questions when you sent the Zoom out. <laughs> yep. Yep. Okay, great. Oh, we just so found this last night. Okay, perfect. Thank you. If anyone has uh, questions, we'll take a moment. You can type it in the chat or just unmute yourself or raise your hand. Um, something I was going to mention earlier in one of the other things that I failed to mention was, um, so um, on top of the fact that I suppress my tics at school and I don't like, like my best friend doesn't even know I have it. Um, so whenever I would go to the bathroom at school, I would then get them out. Now, of course, I don't purposely go to the bathroom to get them out. I just go when I need to go. But 
um, there was a tick that I thought was like too loud and I thought people would like hear it and wonder what I was doing. So I then developed another one that is now just a regular one that I do. It's kind of a weird story of how that one started. It's like, I have to like shake my wrist in a certain way. I don't, I, yeah, it's, it's weird, but it's one of the weirder ways that a tick developed. So Andrew, did you want to know if people had similar experiences? No, that was just a comment that I was making. Oh, great, great. Thank you for sharing. Do any of you guys also hold in ticks and do them at home or in the bathroom or anything like that? Anyone share Andrew's experience? I don't uh, do it on purpose. I just like, well, when I was going places and taking classes, like it's almost like I couldn't tick for some reason. Even though I was comfortable ticking in front of people, I just felt like I couldn't physically tick. It was really weird, at least for some of them. Yeah, oh, I um, hold mine back a lot, um, especially at school, even though I have like a whole like school plan. And um, I actually wrote a letter to my um, fellow cl 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 classmates <laughs> telling them about my um, disorder and everything. And so, like, everyone's been, like, super chill about it, except for, like, you know, like, five or four people who constantly bully me, but. And I usually hold my ticks back, um, especially um, during school or classes, and I do, you go, like, to the bathroom a lot more than usual, just, to, like, let them out. Even though they say it's okay to let them out, I just, like, feel, like, disruptive, and I shouldn't. I used yes, to hold them back. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, I'm sorry. I hold my ticks back a lot. I used to, like, if I was in school, I would have to control it for the whole time. But when I used to get back home, they would do just come out with a burst, and that was like not a good sign because my uh, like all of it was inside. So recent, I uh, did online school. I joined like a uh, home uh, homeschooling thing, and it's been better now. And as I talk, like I my ticks come out with a burst. And whenever they come out in public, I've been I've been bullied a lot, and I've been I faced racism also as I talked on the podcast with Ben, and like uh, like suppressing ticks is actually I, I don't feel it's a good thing. You just do, you should just do what you want. So when I was in school, I I had to suppress them because again I've been in trouble for suppressing my ticks, but <laughs> I was you know perfectly comfortable having my tick moments in the class normally they would come out during like these you know end of the year exams that we have here in florida um so that was you know that was hard because there were like over 100 kids in this room and hearing me with my vocal ticks so it, it was hard and i've had my ticks morph into different sounds so kind of like what uh i don't know what his name was he said he had something with his wrist i'm sorry but um I, I had similar experiences as well with um, ticks morphing just like out of nowhere, you know. I'm going to comment on Shane's thing. So um, we had PSAT testing in like the way beginning of the year. So um, and what I have 504, so I was put in a separate room with like three other people. So um, that's how they did it with me. And if I was having like issues, which I didn't really, they put me in a separate room with just with another just being them. So that's like kind of like how my school was like adapted for like testing. Yeah, they did not do that with me. They they knew I had issues, you know, in regarding my Tourette's, but they put me in the whole auditorium, which was it, it wasn't the funnest thing in the world, but I was, you know, able to pull through it with it. Okay, so I have one question that came in before, and I think, uh, Connie, this is one of the questions that you were referring to, and I'm going to address this to Dr. Lindsay. Um, and the question says, how soon this was treatment begun after onset of, treat of um, symptoms? So this is a really great question, and I'm just pulling from my experience of working with patients over a few years. There really isn't a hard and fast rule about this. I have had patients that were ready for treatment at like age five 
And I had college students that have had ticks forever that were not ready for treatment at age 18. And so the thing that I look for when I think about readiness for treatment is motivation to participate, right? So especially with CBIT, are you guys, any of you guys here CBIT graduates or did CBIT? Yeah, okay, I see, I see some head shaking. CBIT takes massive motivation, right? It is crazy hard. And so that's what I'm looking for when I'm thinking if a patient's ready to start treatment. Do they have the motivation to be successful in this program? The other thing that I'm looking for are those comorbidities in check, which comorbidities, as you guys know, it is so rare. I can count on my single hand the patients that came to see me for tick disorder and Tourette syndrome that did not have anxiety, ADHD, OCD, or depression, right? A lot of you guys all day talked about how you have faced those comorbidities. So when a patient's getting ready for treatment with me, what I want to do is I want to make sure tick disorder is in the driver's seat and the rest of the comorbidities are in the passenger seat. If a patient's OCD is kind of driving the bus, I will work with my OCD colleagues, my, my pharmacological colleagues to make sure those <laughs> symptoms are in control so that a patient comes to me ready to start CBIT treatment or ready to start. A follow-up to go with that, the, um, on the part for new, newly diagnosed people on, on the website, it names four things, and one of them is what you're talking about right now, and it talks about like life success is connected to getting treatment as soon as symptoms start. Can you say more about how, how that's connected and what treatment is it referring to and how soon does that mean? Okay, great, great question. I bet if it's from the web, website, it's probably talking about multidisciplinary treatment. So what I mean by that is do you have an awesome physician or neuro, uh, neurologist that's supporting you? Do you have a good therapeutic treatment team? So those pieces need to be in place. I think the most important thing about starting treatment early, and you guys know that have done CBIT or have done treatment for tick and Tourette, it's about finding your mothership, right? It's about finding your home planet of people that have gone through the same things as you. That's the powerful piece. And that's why we want you guys to get connected to treatment providers as soon as you get this diagnosis. Because I think of that picture that the Tourette Association has of the iceberg. Have you guys seen that iceberg picture before? Yeah, I see, I see a lot of head shaking, right? On that iceberg, it talks about how ticks are the part that's kind of above the water, but all that other stuff that you guys are dealing with on the daily is there under the water. And so by going to treatment early, we start addressing what's on top and what's under, so you guys feel like you have a diagnostic home. Okay, and again, um, you guys will get my contact information. If you're still searching for a treatment team uh, for Tiana that kind of fits, and you want to move fast, I will help you with that. <laughs> that was a tick, but it was also uh, a I thing. like it. Raise the roof, girl. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Lindsay. Does anyone else have questions or comments they'd like to share? Um, so I was actually misdiagnosed. So I was just like wondering if anyone else had like the same experience. Because we went to a couple different, we, uh, different uh, doctors, and the first one was like, all right, you have Tourette's, but you have to wait a year. Well, we think you have Tourette's, but you have to wait a year for the official diagnosis. Went to the second doctor, and he basically told me it had something to do with, like, seizures, and I wasn't having tics at all. And um, even though I was diagnosed with a tic disorder at four. And so basically he told me that everything that I'd known was basically not true and basically I was having like these seizures but they were not technically seizures and so we went to the other doctor and we we're like what about that and he goes um and so basically we figured out it's not that we don't um so yeah it's just big misdiagnosis thing because yeah I I hear this from in the podcast community all the time of people going to different doctors they they can't find anybody credible who seems to have the knowledge to diagnose within uh, a fair drive time. So they would have to travel, uh, you know, kind of extraordinary distances to find someone who had the credibility to be able to diagnose it correctly. Uh, I've talked with some people who've been to four or five, six doctors who, um, uh, same thing. It, they'll, sometimes it's, it's put down as like, oh, it's all kids do that. It, it'll go away. Don't worry about it. And then they'll go, they'll go to another doctor, hear the same thing. And another doctor will say, 
Uh, it might be something, just, just something completely different. It's, it can be a really frustrating journey. And, um, and my parents, I think, went through roughly the, the same thing. Of course, this was back in the 1980s when a lot less was known about it uh, in circles. But these days still, yeah, there's a lot of education I think needs to be, needs to happen with doctors. Yeah. I think I'm lucky enough because I only had to go to one doctor and well, it was like, it was my pediatrician and then technically two, but like she recommended a neurologist and I had to like do like a quick like survey, like, and then she just looked at me. She's like, Hey, you have Tourette's. I'm like, I don't know how she did it, but like, Apparently, it's that. So when I first went to my um, pediatrician, he claimed that I had some sort of stress disorder. So I don't know if that's really considered a misdiagnosis, if that's just kind of what he thought it was. He thought Because he did say then that could be Tourette's after the fact, but um, just wanted to throw that out there as well. <laughs> My experience was interesting. So growing up, I, you know, like I said, I started having tics around four and five. And when I go to my annual checkup with a pediatrician, my mom would tell him every time, hey, she's kind of doing these like weird movements and everything. And he goes, yeah, kids do that. She'll grow out of it. Um, you know, a few, few more years. Uh, she's like, hey, she's still doing these little twitches and tics. And he was like, sometimes it takes a little bit longer for them to grow out of it and she's like okay a few more years passed and he was like okay play along and basically he told my family to join in and kind of mimic my tics to try to get me to stop um and if anything that definitely helped me um learn how to suppress because it was humiliating um i know which is sad but i mean i had to find out on my own that i had tourette's and i did and i'm thankful that i got to finally get the diagnosis from a neurologist but when I was 19 I started going to therapy and they eventually they diagnosed they misdiagnosed me sorry with ADHD and started putting me on Vyvanse which makes made my tics significantly worse and it was like one of the worst <laughs> worst things that someone could have ever said to me I don't know why but they were thought oh well you must have ADHD mm -mm. Dr. Lindsay, I don't know if you wanted to chime in. One thing I do want to say is that if you ever, if you guys need to find a provider, we do have a provider listing on our Tourette Association website. So if, um, if you ever need, have any questions as well, you can always reach out to us um, and if you need help finding um, more information. Yes, I think everything you guys are saying are backed up in the history of Tourette diagnoses, right? So prior to 2005, you actually had to have coprolalia to meet criteria for Tourette syndrome. So there's an entire generation of people walking around that have Tourette syndrome that do not know that they have Tourette syndrome, right? Something else that you guys touched on that I heard is when we have those com comorbidities driving the bus, physicians and doctors might focus on that ADHD or that anxiety or that stress that you were going through, Shane, hyper-focus on that and not focus on the tick piece. So I've seen that a lot. And then if we just look at symptoms, I've seen patients that have had incorrect allergy and pulmonology diagnoses, right? Because maybe they're sniffing or throwing their, uh, clearing their throat or coughing. And they've spent years working with an allergist or an ENT on those medications when it was a tick disorder all along, right? Another thing that you guys touched on that I think is frustrating is that year mark, right? So one of you just talked about like, oh, I have these tick symptoms, but it wasn't a year. So we had to do like a provisional diagnosis. It's so frustrating that we have to wait for that calendar year. So sometimes when I, when I am working and I'm trying to decide if it's a Tourette diagnosis, I make sure to do a really solid history. So like Haley, if I was seeing you, I would have been asking all the way back to when you were age four or five and counting that for that Tourette syndrome diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Instead of the second you see me, that's when the year mark starts. It's hard. So no, I, I, I didn't have to wait for my diagnosis. I was just like that. It was really strange to me. Sorry about my dog. <laughs> so for getting diagnosed, I think it was, I'm not, I don't fully remember. I know my mom has told me 
the story of that day several times, but living in the Twin Cities, it's um, nice because I just had to go to Minneapolis to get diagnosed instead of traveling like four hours like some people have to. Um, but I think it was mostly um, I was at a doctor's appointment, not because we thought I had Tourette's, but because it was a doctor's appointment, or I don't remember what it was, because again, this was like 10, 12 years ago, so maybe not quite, I don't know exactly how many years ago it was. This is what happens when you're 17 and it's before you were a teenager. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I must have been like ticking or something, and she was like, uh, does he act like this? And my mom was like, yeah. Okay, I think he has the rest. <laughs> yep. So, and I mean, I used to do some like weird things that I did quite frequently, but my parents just thought I was goofing around and then we <laughs> figured it out. So, yeah, I don't fully remember the story of that day, but that's the best I remember it. Thank you for sharing, Andrew. One other question that we have is, do you guys have any tips for driving with ticks and OCD? So I had the same idea or, you know, problem in my head when I got my license is how is this going to affect my driving in any way? So when I got into the car and I started driving, I was so, you know, concentrated on the road that, and I'm think this might be for everyone <laughs> that I'm so focused on the road that, not, none of my ticks come up and appear. I'm just, you know, concentrated and they totally disappear like they would when I'm, you know, with my dog. I, I was, I was terrified to drive. Uh, I didn't want to when I was uh, 15. I had to go through driver's education, get the learner's permit and everything. I was absolutely horrified because I thought I would do something wrong or I would get in a wreck or uh, b because of ticking, because I had these muscle tensing ticks. I was worried about jerking the wheel and just, um, uh, it, it did kind of dissolve, I think, from the level of focus and concentration that I needed or that I required to drive successfully is that I was able to kind of put myself in the zone and get past it. And again, that's, that's just me. It might be different for you guys, but uh, the fear kind of dissolves. Um, but I think the performance expectation uh, kind of pulled me through in a way. I was terrified of driving just because I had a lot of anxiety starting and I didn't want to mess up or anything. I wasn't even comfortable driving until I was about 17. And once I started, my tics weren't as bad as like an older teenager. Now, I what I do is I try to time them so I can suppress pretty well now. So what I do is I time them and try to reroute them until I can let them out safely. So I have a tick where I have to press really hard on the brakes. Thankfully not the accelerator, but on the brakes. So sometimes when I, if I know that there's not many cars around or behind me, I'll kind of start pressing it a little bit. And once there's a stoplight, I, well, I, I wait and I slow down. And then once I'm in a full stop, I press it really, really hard. And then I'll have to do it with my other foot. So I have to like switch it up. And it, it scares me a little bit. Um, I have another one where I have to turn the brights on and I have to hold it really like, firmly so that I usually wait until I'm in my neighborhood and I can do it a bunch of times and hopefully not blind any people <laughs> you know when I um when I practice driving around this ranch um like with with Tourette's it's like yeah you have this mentality like you 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 can't really tell and, like you always think like there's two ways you can go about thinking oh it's probably fine it's driving everyone does it or two you have Tourette's and this is gonna go to absolute hell and you really don't know what's gonna happen and like you get in the car and and you have I have this mentality that it's like you're in a car and like you're you're like it's it's crazy you think about it like you're kind of putting your life at risk there so you have to have this men this one it's the mentality that you're in a car and you just have to you'd have you have to get over it really and two um you to add on to it I I focus on my breathing often too so I like I have like this rhythm as I'm practicing and it kind of helps me through it. And I also like tap my fingers like that, like that, like, like on the steering wheel. But yeah, it's definitely like these really small motor ticks that, that I do with the, with the whole breathing and the tapping the fingers that really gets me through it. Well, I've been 
but like I practiced like driving like in my high school parking lot. I remember one night I was coming home from work and my mom, we had like a rental car and I'm like, I like this car a lot. She's like, you want to drive it? I'm like, in a rental car. <laughs> and I told her that. She's like, yeah. And I was doing it in the parking lot at night and like my ticks were just gone because I was just so focused on basically just doing circles. And I have a coworker that has trust too. Um, and he's like one of my buddies now. Um, he had to take me home one night and his ticks weren't bad when he was just driving. And he's like, I'm just used to it, so. Actually, I had a question that kind of relates to driving or, or it, my mind went there because of this. Um, my ticks have been worse the past couple of years. I'm 17. And um, so like through, as I got later into the teen years, it's gotten worse. Um, and I find it, it, my charge pretty much affects everything I do. And I just feel like I can't do anything anymore. Like, like if I try to you know, like even watching TV or something, I feel like I like, I'll turn it off or I'm trying to cook or I'll like try to burn myself. Like, it just feels like everything I do, it's impacted by it. And it reminded me of the driving because I feel like if I can't even do simple things like that, how am I going to be able to drive? So kind of just ways like, like any suggestions on how to work on things, like even like with really simple things that is just getting in the way of everything, you know, how to work on those so something that helped me because i had the same issue when i was around 13 or 14 the littlest things i would have to break this or do something this way and not the proper way something like that and what helped me was breathing or stress balls i would have stress stress, stress balls and i would squeeze them when i felt the tick coming or something that would affect me doing like my homework or just it's just the little things stress balls help me a lot so just to point that out thanks dr lindsay i don't know if you had something to say about the driving or for olivia's question sure so for olivia a follow-up question i have for you do you have a provider a therapeutic team do you, have, do you have a source of support? Yeah, a, a lot. I've seen like neurologists. I have a psychiatrist. I have a psychologist. I, uh, I mean, my family members, I have some that are doctors. And so I, okay. I do have a lot of help and I've tried different medications. I just, those have, haven't worked. And then so, yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like you have a, a big tribe around you, but it sounds like ticks are still so functionally impairing for you, right? Yeah. yeah. I think it's so hard, and we talked about this a lot today, you know, there is no magic medication for ticks, right? You guys are geniuses, you know this, because it's a diagnosis of structure and not a chemical diagnosis. So, you know, people get their comorbidities medicated to the hilt, but still struggle on the day-to-day -day stuff. So, I mean, I would lean heavy on your treatment team. Olivia, I can just speak anecdotally. I think the life that we're living right now in the pandemic has made a lot of this worse because if you think about the best recommendations of your doctors would be getting out, engaging with others, interacting with people. COVID's making us do the very opposite, right? So we're isolating, we're not interacting with people. And so I just, the biggest thing I can tell you is just to know on the hard days, you're not alone. Like day after day after day, I hear Ian saying the exact same thing. And it's because we're just kind of isolated with some of our worst thoughts and our worst behaviors, and it just makes a, a tick mess. Okay, so I just want to support you and let you know that. Thank you. Okay. For driving, I have kind of a funny recommendation. So I, um, when I was a teenager, I was nervous about driving too. And my um, mom took me to a cemetery to learn how to drive. I was like, why are we in a cemetery? And she said, well, Katrina, everyone's already dead, so you can't kill them. So... Um, actually learning to drive in a cemetery was awesome because you can only go five miles an hour. The roads are usually silky smooth asphalt. And so for a lot of my CBIT patients that are worried about driving, we will do a special CBIT booster specific to driving. And then I send them to the cemetery at the Pine Akron Children's Hospital to practice some of the strategies. So as you guys are learning how to drive, maybe start in a cemetery first. 
from my mom to you. <laughs> um, I um actually um the first time I started practicing driving was a long time ago, but the first time I was actually like um pedals and wheels. I was in a parking lot, like a Target empty parking lot. I feel like that's better than a um cemetery, but <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Your mom has a point. I mean, there there are people going to Target, but I don't know. But um, I've grew up playing driving games like Need for Speed and stuff like that, so I'm actually quite comfortable driving, and my tics are actually suppressed when I drive because I feel comfortable and it's fun. Thank you for sharing that, Christian. We have a few more minutes, um, so we may be able to take one or two more questions. Um, so I personally have not done driver's ed yet. That's something I hope to do in the future. But I have a friend who has Tourette's who um, has um, an interesting tick. She has a middle finger tick, and so she just does it below the dashboard so that nobody sees it. <laughs> um, Katrina, yeah, you, you sound like a, a really good doctor. And um, so I want to know what your thought process was on someone with Tourette's um, who is thinking about like going into the me going into the, sorry, going into the medical field, specifically of being a surgeon. Oh, you guys are the best doctors, right? Especially when I think about pediatric surgeons, right? If you guys have a chronic diagnosis and you've done this before, think about the powerful connection that you have with patients. So when I don't, when I'm not in tick and Tourette, I work in hematology and oncology, and I have a couple pediatric cancer survivors that want to go on and be oncologists. Imagine what it would be like to be a child with cancer and your doctor also went through the same cancer as you. Like that is truly, truly powerful. So back as you might know, and I talk about this a lot, a lot of you look familiar and might have heard me say this, with Tourette syndrome comes superpowers, right? You guys are highly intelligent. Your mean IQ is 110, 10 points more than the rest of us mere mortals, right? You're highly perceptive and you're highly sensitive. And that has to do with the amazing brain that you guys have. So if you take perception, sensitivity, and intelligence, man, that would make the best surgeon. So I encourage that dream. You guys go on to do amazing things. You're genius. So yes, go light the world up. That's awesome. I just have to add to Dr. Lindsay real quick. There was a um, pilot that, so my mom works at a private aviation uh, facility uh, where they charter, you know, private planes. And there was a pilot that worked for one of those uh, aviation companies. And he had very severe vocal tics and physical tics. So um, everyone, you know, in the lobby was kind of making fun of him and stuff. But apparently when he starts, you know, flying the plane, uh, everything disappears. And I just, I think that's so cool that he was able to with the variety of ticks and the, his Tourette's that he had, I thought that was pretty cool. And I'm trying to be a pilot, so I, th I just thought that was cool. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. I see Cameron has their hand raised. I just want to make sure that we get their question before time runs out. Okay, <laughs> sorry. So, I have like really bad and like truce, intrusive thoughts, mainly goes along with, it associates with anxiety and my tics a lot too. And so I was just wondering if anyone had like some good coping meta, um, methods to like deal with the intrusive thoughts and help and like focus on other things. Yeah, with, with me, this is something that it, it kind of gets back to what I was saying before about standing out in the cold. I try to just have something to just kind of jar me for a minute. If it's holding a piece of ice against my face or like a cold can of soda or just something to make me feel different just for a minute, um, it can put me on a slightly different track. It's not necessarily a cure or anything like that. I'll still have intrusive thoughts, but but if, if I do it enough to where I, or if I, you know, um, 
drink something really sour, like lemon juice or, or just something like that. Like it, it does seem to have a positive effect on me because I'm an adult and I still live with it. I still live with anxiety, depression, all that stuff. Um, but I, I found it to be, um, I don't know if manageable is the right word, but I can put myself on a slightly different track and I think kind of push myself to the end of the tunnel a little bit quicker um, rather than just kind of sitting unregulated, unmitigated, just dwelling in my intrusive thoughts. So that's something that helps me. Um, for me, I basically listen to music and I watch TV, play video games. Honestly, if it gets that bad and I run out of ideas, I'll read a book, <laughs> which is very unlikely. And then there is my last resort. I, I am not telling anybody to do this, but my last resort is giving myself a tick attack. Because that's still going to take your mind off of the intrusive thoughts. Because you're going to be thinking one thing, and then if you give yourself a tick attack, you're going to be thinking, how do I get rid of this? That's why it is a last resort. Me personally, I just distract myself. Um, my OCD has been quite severe in 2020. I'm now on medication for it, and it's made it so much better for my thoughts. What I always do, similar to what Ben does, is go outside. And I spend a lot of time with my animals outside. I love hanging out with my dog, my cat, and I have goats. And they're the best thing for me, I'm telling you. Um, and yeah, sometimes taking a walk outside just to kind of clear my head, listen to music, watch TV, go on TikTok. It, anything that I can do to distract myself from my thoughts. Yeah, the, the sensory experience of being outside is pretty powerful, I think. Yeah, it is. I mean, I, I would ride my bike, but um, I live in Michigan, and um, we have snow, so uh, and it's cold, but um, so I can't really go outside, but I do my best. Yeah, I was going to say, one of my big things is roller skating. I love to roller skate, and I roller skate, we have a, I live in a very flat town, so it's like no hills or anything, so it's kind of perfect for roller skating. And, but there is a lot of snow outside right now because I live in Nebraska and the weather is different every year. There was snow in November. It was like 80 degrees out just last week and now there's snow on the ground. So it's always kind of hard to get out and roller skate. Anyone else have anything to add? Just a side note as to what they were saying is, yeah, um, our weather is kind of weird too. Like most winters will have snow, but like we had less snow this winter than I was expecting. And by the way, I'm in Minnesota, so yeah. I just had a question. Does anyone else have like um, Zoom related ticks? Because I do. Like I always try to like like end the call and like I'll like drop off and then my and then my teacher will have to let me back in and then I, it happens again. And Yes, big, me, big. Okay, so in the classroom, it's not as much because I'm one of those kids, and don't freak out, but I, I, like, I like school. I like learning. I don't know why, but Zoom is one of those things. Like, when I watch too much TV, it's like I go, like, these insane tick attacks. So, like, I, I have no clue. And, it, and it's the same on Zoom. Like, I always have to turn off my video and, my, like, my camera or whatever and just, like, get it over with. And, like, the same thing. I can't remember who was who was saying it. I think it was Christian who was saying that, like, to give yourself that tick attack. What I'll like, I'll I'll stop my camera and I'll like let just let it happen to get it over with. But I totally know what you're talking about. I get it. I have something similar. I not Zoom specific, but computer and phone. I have to tap everything a lot, and that means I start exiting out of stuff or I might send something by accident and I'm like I have to fix everything or I have to click my mouse a bunch and the space bar the backspace especially just the tapping on my phone especially yeah I'll like accidentally FaceTime my friend like when I like don't mean to and like I'll just click everything and yeah I've done that before <laughs> wow we can go on forever everyone um I just want to thank you guys so much for attending the first ever Teen Summit. I want to thank our
presenters who did such an amazing, phenomenal job with um, their sessions today. I really, I just a huge, huge thank you to all of you who stayed today and shared your stories and your experiences with Tarot. You know, for me, honestly, the best part is listening to you guys see you guys talk to each other. So it's just amazing. Um, and so thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I will ask everyone if you can just take one moment to take our evaluation. I'm sure all of you, if you have smartphones, you can just open your camera app and just point it and then you'll have a survey pop up. This is really important for us because we'll learn more about what you enjoyed about the Teen Summit, what you wish you could have, we could have improved so that in the future we can um, improve our programming. So thank you again so much. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to the Tart Association. We're here to support you. We know that 2020 was a very difficult year and lots of adjusting to change. So, you know, hopefully this year will be better for all of you guys. And you guys are such a resilient group and it's just amazing to hear about all of the great things that you have done. Um, so thank you. And uh, I hope you guys have a great rest of the night. Quick question. I'm on a phone, so I can't scan the barcode. Sure, I can send you, uh, let me try through the chat or I'll ask, um, Chelsea or uh, Wendy, if you're uh, on I the just, link. suppose you could just take a screenshot and have somebody else scan it. That's what I did because I don't have a phone. So I just screenshotted it and I'll have my mom scan it later. Yeah. Screenshot it. We also have a yourself. link that we will, we will be sending up a follow-up email, everyone, and we have your information and that will have the um, survey link. So if you guys don't, can't do it now, if you can do it with like, the next few days, it'll be super important for us. Thank you. Was everyone able to see the screen, the QR code, or does anyone want me to show it one last time before I? I was able to see it. Was everyone Sorry, able to see it? Show it again? I didn't yeah, even know what let it me show it again. No, of course. What do we use to scan it? If you have a smartphone, you can use that. If not, let me see if I can pull up the link and, and try to put it on the chat for everyone. I also sent the link through the chat. Let me know if that works for everyone. If not, I'll, I'm gonna set up a follow-up email. Actually, um, I had a question for Natalie. Um, with the, um, so, sure. yeah. Do you, do you want to e um, send it through the chat, or would you? Do you want to say it in front of everyone? Yeah, I can just say it in front of everyone. Just um, we like to um, a way to connect with like other than this to connect with other like you know kids my age with charts. I mean, I should know this because I'm a youth ambassador. Um, but like just with the you know, through the TAA, do you guys have? Of course, Olivia. Yes, yes. You know what I could do? I can email you and then we can talk about different ways for you to get connected with more um, kids and other youth ambassadors. Would you like that? Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. Okay, perfect. So I'll be in contact with you, okay? Okay, cool. Okay, everyone. So hopefully I gave everyone enough time to get the link and uh, to open it on your computer. I'm going to stop sharing and thank you again for taking the time and we'll be in touch um, shortly. With, uh, soon with everyone. So thank you and have a great rest of your day. Bye everyone. You too. You. Thanks.